from uh, Florida State University, and he will be talking about interplay of topology and geometry in fractional quantum hall liquids. Kun, um, floor is thank yours. Thank you very much. So I would like to join previous speakers to thank the organizers for putting together this exciting program. Uh, on the other hand, they put me in this very tough spot of speaking after Janander. I don't know if I want to thank them for that. But at least to get the chance to uh, congratulate Janandra for the recent election to the uh, National Science uh, 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 Academy, uh, which is not only well deserved, but also a long overdue, actually, in my opinion. Anyway, so um, I have a topology in the title of my talk, like many talks these days. Um, as we, of course, all understand that topology is responsible for the uh, universal physics that we see and heard a lot about uh, recently, uh, in this week, actually. But um, that's actually not the keyword of, of this talk. Uh, I actually highlight a different word in the title. So as uh, pointed out by Duncan uh, in the paper almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, there is actually very interesting non-universal physics uh, in uh, quantum Hall effect, especially fractional quantum Hall effect. And some of the non-universal physics is actually associated with geometry, not just the uh, topology. So um, the first uh, take home message uh, for my talk is this geometry is not only a uh, theoretical, theoretical construct, but also actually a uh, ex experimental observable. In fact, it has been uh, measured and uh, it actually allows for a direct comparison with theory now. So this geometry not only exists, it also has very interesting uh, quantum dynamics. And as pointed out by uh, two of our organizers uh, and their collaborators, uh, this uh, quantum dynamics gives rise to a spin two neutral excitation called gravitons. Uh, we heard a very nice talk yesterday by Zong actually discussing a little bit of the history of, the, of this notion. So uh, the second uh, take home message is that uh, these gravitons can actually also be excited and probed uh, experimentally. Uh, one way to do that is to use uh, acoustic wave which as I'm going to explain actually behaves very much like uh, a gravitational waves. So uh, the final uh, take home message, which I think is perhaps the most interesting is that these gravitons actually has a, a definitive chirality and their chirality can also be measured in particular uh, using a polarized Raman scattering. And applying this idea to the uh, specific state of five halves, it may actually help us uh, uh, pin down the uh, precise nature. So let's actually nevertheless start with topology, which uh, uh, I'm using uh, pictures or what Xiaogang would call dancing patterns to uh, characterize them. So the initial quantum Hall effect was, uh, has this uh, somewhat uh, trivial and uh, uh, perhaps a boring dancing pattern, namely every dancer is just uh, dancing around uh, her own uh, loop. Uh, the only constraint, of course, is that uh, the lambda quantization gives rise to a specific area of the loop and the Pauli uh, principle tells you you have to actually stay within your own uh, territory. But the uh, locking type of a fractional dancing pattern is uh, uh, much more interesting. Uh, with a lower uh, fitting factor, you uh, have more room to dance around, but to uh, minimize uh, a cool interaction when two dancers approach each other, uh, you should actually avoid each other. And uh, if this dancer is sitting here, uh, dancing here, the other dancer has to actually dance around her uh, in three steps. And uh, the even more interesting uh, dancing pattern, of course, gives rise to a non abelian uh, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect. So the more real dancing pattern allows uh, two dancers to be as close as a uh, uh, party principle would actually, uh, would actually permit them to be. But once the couple is actually doing their intimate things, a third dancer needs to actually a loop around this couple uh, in four steps, for example. So the dancing patterns are actually quite highly constraining, but they are not uh, 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 completely rigid. Um, well, in my words, I guess uh, what Duncan pointed out is that there is actually this geometrical freedom. That is, you're allowed to uh, distort this, uh, the shape of this loop, but the topological constraint is that the area of this loop has to remain the same. And for one third locking state, is, it has to be precisely uh, three uh, flux quanta or three uh, unit areas of uh, uh, magnetic length. 
So, uh, so uh, uh, therefore, it is described uh, by uh, what is called the area preserving dimorphism, a term we have heard uh, several times already uh, uh, during this uh, workshop. And the reason you might want to distort this shape is, well, maybe the uh, cooling interaction is uh, anisotropic. Uh, that this would be the case if you have anisotropic uh, dielectric constant then you might want to avoid each other more along this direction than that direction. And more relevant to recent experiments that I'm going to get to, uh, if you have a, a anisotropic effect of mass, then the natural, long, natural lambda orbital has a distorted shape uh, as well. So a, a immediate uh, consequence of the uh, existence of this geometrical degree of freedom is contrary to common belief uh, the Laughlin state actually has a hidden variational parameter, which actually describes this geometry. And uh, um, we have actually uh, constructed this uh, uh, one parameter family of Laughlin states. So the original Laughlin wave function uh, is actually a very special, completely isotropic uh, 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 state uh, with this uh, isotropic. Uh, correlation hole, but if you vary this geometrical parameter a little bit for this particular value, you see a, a distorted correlation hole, but they should have the same area. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this uh, geometrical aspect of the laughing state uh, is not visible in the ordinary uh, transport measurement, where you see, of course, this plateau and vanishing longitudinal uh, resistance, both of which are actually dictated by um, Topology. So in this sense, topology actually gets in the way of observing this very interesting uh, geometry. Now, uh, what can we do? Well, obviously, well, not, not entirely obviously, and actually there's even richer physics uh, for these uh, so-called hierarchy, or actually in particular, Jane sequence states. Um, I guess Don alluded to that a little bit yesterday. Uh, but the point is that uh, you have this entire family of fractional quantum pulse states that ends at this non-quantized uh, pulse state at one half, which in Jane's uh, uh, composite fermion theory is actually the parent of all the neighboring fractional quantum pulse states, including one third. So if the fractional quantum pulse states have this geometrical property, so should this parent, uh, this one half compressible state. And what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next few minutes is to actually uh, uh, demonstrate that indeed it exists and it can be actually probed. In fact, it has already been, already been probed um, by Mansell Sheridan's group, uh, even though they may not be aware that uh, at, at the beginning that they are actually probing this uh, quantum geometry, quantum hall geometry. So what they are doing is actually uh, 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 very interesting. So we all know that if we have electrons at zero magnetic field, uh, they form a Fermi liquid with a, a, a Fermi surface, which will be uh, circular if you have isotropic effect of mass. And we also understand very well that when we go to half filling, uh, electrons are turned into composite fermions and they form a, a circular composite fermion Fermi surface. And what Janandra, sorry, uh, what uh, Mansour was asking is, well, what if you start with a anisotropic effective mass to begin with, which would give rise to an anisotropic electron Fermi surface, what would happen when you now go to one half and uh, whether you have, uh, what kind of shape the composite Fermi and Fermi surface should, should take? So Mansour explained actually uh, quite uh, in quite a bit of detail how to actually measure the Fermi surface. So here I'm just going to add that he can actually control the uh, uh, effective mass tensor in two different ways. Initially, he was using a parallel magnetic field, which actually uh, gives rise, which actually couples to the electron motion through the effective mass tensor, which is a rank two tensor. And in anticipation to what I'm going to talk about later, I write it as a, a, a metric form, to make it look like a, a, a metric. Um, later, uh, he actually also uses a string to control uh, the same effective mass tensor. So um, the key finding, uh, initial finding, is that the composite Fermi Fermi surface is also anisotropic as, uh, as, as expected. But for some reason, it has a 
less and also much less anisotropy than the electron Fermi surface. So this is actually opposite to uh, the naive expectation from the chain summons mean field theory, in which you just actually uh, cancel the external magnetic field by smearing out the flux carried by the composite fermions, you would actually end up getting exactly the same effective, effective mass cancer and therefore the same, um, same uh, 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 shape for the uh, composite fermions. So the relation between the shape of the composite fermions were not immediately clear. So uh, my first uh, statement is that actually this composite fermion Fermi surface is a direct reflection of Haldane's geometry. And we have a, a new perspective on this uh, uh, area preserving isomorphism because in momentum space, we know something actually uh, very well that is known as the uh, Luttinger theorem. Namely, the Fermi surface can change its shape, but not its area. So therefore we have a uh, um, area preserving Diffeomorphism in momentum space, uh, which I claim to be uh, exactly the same as the uh, area preserving diffeomorphism uh, Duncan talks about in real space. So, to demonstrate this point, uh, I actually introduce an exactly solvable model that allows for direct calculation of the change of the, uh, of the geometry. So, we start with the bare interaction, which, uh, just for simplicity, I can assume to be isotropic. Of course, uh, that doesn't make the problem easy because you have to uh, 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 project the uh, um, interaction to the, uh, uh, to the particular lambda level, let's say the uh, lowest lambda level. And the uh, effective mass anisotropy is actually reflected in the lambda level form factor, which is not anisotropic. So you have a isotropic interaction, but an anisotropic lambda level form factor. So the specific model that I considered uh, is actually chosen to be a Gaussian interaction. The reason the Gaussian interaction is nice is because it's fully transformed is also Gaussian. So now I have a Gaussian interaction combined with the anisotropic Gaussian form factor for the lowest lambda level. And that of course uh, results in yet another Gaussian whose anisotropy I can read out directly. And because it's a combination of an anisotropic Gaussian and isotropic Gaussian, the resultant anisotropy has to be less than the anisotropy coming from the effective mass tensor. So qualitatively, uh, I immediately can claim that the uh, um, uh, Fermi surface anisotropy, uh, a half fitting has to be less than the anisotropy uh, at zero magnetic field. But what I have done here is just uh, playing games with the Hamiltonian. I haven't even specified the uh, um, feeling factor yet. So I made a statement about half filling, but I can make exactly the same statement for one third filling in which we expect a uh, laughing like fraction of quantum Hall state. And that must therefore also have the same anisotropy. So for the half filling case, uh, this has been uh, uh, confirmed by detailed uh, numerical study. So um, in later experiments, Mansour's group actually have performed a detailed study of the relation between the uh, uh, anisotropy of the CF Fermi surface, I have feeling, as a function of the uh, uh, zero field electron anisotropy, which they now control, uh, control by actually string, and found this fairly accurate uh, empirical relation that uh, the CF anisotropy is the square root of the electron, what they call F of fermion anisotropy. So uh, in their uh, attempt to actually compare this relation with, uh, uh, with my earlier formula, they noticed something that I actually didn't uh, realize, which is once you factor out the square root dependence, you find that uh, if you choose the only the single parameter in my Gaussian interaction, namely the range of the Gaussian, to be exactly the same as the magnetic lens, this extra factor actually cancels out exactly and you get exact agreement. Now, of course, the actual cool interaction uh, is not uh, uh, even close to the, uh, um, to the uh, Gaussian interaction used in this, uh, in this simple model, but uh, uh, there is actually a very uh, reasonable, uh, it's very reasonable to actually associate the magnetic lens um, as its, uh, uh, as its uh, corresponding length scale 
because once you project uh, the interaction to the uh, lowest lambda level, the only length scale there is indeed the magnetic lens. And uh, a detailed uh, numerical study from the same group also actually finds very accurate square root relation for the uh, crew interaction. So I think it's fair to say that uh, we have indeed seen uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, quantum hall geometry and have actually a reasonable uh, quantitative understanding of it. So the question now uh, is, what is uh, its, its dynamics? So uh, as pointed out earlier, and I also discussed earlier by other speakers, they are expected to give rise to a spin two of graviton excitation. Uh, precursors of this observation actually goes back uh, all the way to 1990 by uh, uh, Deng Haili and Xu Chen Zhang. And different perspectives of um, this understanding uh, uh, actually comes from uh, considerations of a nomadic instability of quantum pole states by uh, Eduardo, uh, Steve, and uh, Shivaji and their uh, collaborators. So the, the, the prediction is the following. So we now understand very, we, we all understand very well that there is this magneto roton mode um, at finite wave vector, uh, which of course, when you go to the long wavelength uh, uh, limit, it enters the particle hole continuum. But the prediction is that we still should have a, a mode uh, which is called graviton uh, at zero wave vector. Uh, so the, the, uh, the question is how do you actually excite it and how do you probe it? Now, uh, well, the, the, the problem of course is that the usual uh, electromagnetic probe using, using light is, uh, is not quite uh, effective because of the, uh, because of the uh, um, uh, Cohen theorem, which tells us that uh, its uh, spectral weight is exhausted by the cyclotron mode. And another way to understand this, of course, is that uh, the uh, uh, graviton mode has spin two, but the photon has spin one, so there is a mismatch. So a natural idea is to actually use not electromagnetic wave, but gravitational wave. So we, of course, all understand that we have gravitational wave uh, propagating in our rooms uh, 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 all the time. Uh, but uh, it was actually not quite the case when I actually made this proposal in August 2015, which happened to be about a month and a half before the arrival of the first LIGO signal. Uh, as, a, as a result, my referees didn't like the notion of gravitational wave or gravita gravitational response. Uh, of course, what, what I was really talking about was not the LIGO gravitational wave, but actually an analog of gravitational wave uh, mimicked by uh, acoustic wave. So as I mentioned earlier, um, our metric is actually played by, the role of our metric is actually played by the effective mass tensor, which uh, is actually controllable by string. And acoustic wave, uh, of course, induces a lattice distortion and therefore induces string. So um, if you actually propagate a, a acoustic wave uh, through the crystal, uh, including, of course, a two-dimensional electron gas. Uh, it actually induces local string and therefore induces oscillation of this metric, which is precisely what a uh, gravitational wave does. So in this setup, the acoustic wave is a, a perpendicular to the two decks, so therefore it has finite frequency, but exactly zero momentum because the electrons uh, only see the momentum parallel to the, to the, to the plane. Uh, if you want to really control the uh, uh, wave vector and frequency independently of what I call the gravitational wave, you can actually adjust this angle. And the limiting case, of course, is the surface acoustic wave, which is widely used in quantum Hall studies. Okay, so, um, well, how does the, uh, how does the uh, gravitational wave, in quotation marks perhaps, couple to the two deck? Well, uh, you can actually uh, do the calculation very easily. Again, it is through the lambda level uh, form factor, and if you have oscillating effective mass, it has therefore oscillating piece in the form factor. And once you expand it, you find that it couples uh, 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 in a two-body, through a two-body operator for two-body interaction. But importantly, uh, the coupling has this dx squared minus y squared form. So indeed, it has D wave form, meaning that it couples to spin two excitations. And you can measure the spectral function of this coupling operator by measuring the uh, absorption rate. And this is like a gravitational wave analog of our cyclotron resonance uh, measurement. 
Okay, so, so therefore, uh, coming back to this picture, uh, if you have this graviton mode at zero wave vector, uh, you can tune your uh, well, acoustic wave to be exactly perpendicular to the two deck, and the graviton mode should show up as a peak in the graviton uh, spectral function. So, um, so we actually calculated this special function um, uh, 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 for small sizes, actually, uh, as part of my unsuccessful rebuttal uh, uh, at PRL. And we saw very sharp uh, at the point, seemingly infinitely sharp uh, peaks, actually with very, very high uh, uh, spectral weights, almost completely exhausting the uh, uh, spectral weight in this case. Uh, the first published calculation of this kind was actually uh, by these gentlemen uh, in the audience, and the Larco talked about that on Tuesday, I guess. And the sharpness of the of these graviton peaks are actually crucial for the long coherence of uh, of, of, of the uh, oscillations that they observe after the punch. But uh, this particular spectral function, which has this dx y dx, d, uh, x squared minus y squared form does not reveal the chirality of the gravitons, uh, which uh, we actually uh, have heard earlier and uh, I will emphasize later as well, is an extremely important property of, of the gravitons. So, so in our published calculation, we actually instead calculated the chiral versions of these operators, uh, the basically d plus id and d minus id, uh, which corresponds to uh, graviton excitations with mo uh, angular momentum minus two and plus two uh, respectively. And we found indeed, first of all, there is a finite width um, that actually Bert uh, 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 anticipated yesterday in the spectral function. So it's not completely sharp, but still quite sharp. But very importantly, the spectral weight comes exclusively from the minus two piece, while the plus two piece has exactly zero spectral weight for the laughing phase. So what that means is that the graviton has a definitive angular momentum minus two for the laughing and actually electron-like state. And the ground state can also be viewed as a vacuum of these gravitons. On the other hand, if you switch the whole state, well, the chirality actually reverses, and you should have plus two uh, gravitons instead. I'm going to actually uh, provide a simple picture of how to understand these uh, in the next two slides. Now, this, of course, is for model interaction. For realistic uh, cooler interaction, uh, well, the peaks are not quite as sharp, but still reasonably sharp. And there's also more finite side effects. But uh, we can still do some uh, extrapolation and uh, uh, obtain the uh, graviton energy in these cases. And as discussed earlier, um, they can actually be measured using Raman scattering because unlike cyclotron uh, resonance, Raman is actually a two photon process. So two spin one photons can actually match the quantum number of a spin two graviton. Um, and we actually found reasonable semi-quantitative agreement in terms of energetics. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, um, the uh, 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 original experiment by Aaron Pinsack's group uh, did not use spin polarized Raman, so the uh, chirality uh, was actually not revealed. And I should mention that in this very nice recent paper, uh, uh, Zhang and Song uh, uh, pointed out that actually the spectral function we calculated would be exactly the same as the Raman spectral function if you actually ignore the small anisotropy of the valence band. So we also calculated uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the graviton spectral function for the more rich state uh, for the somewhat uh, a toy case of new equal to one bosons. And again, found that uh, you have uh, 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 only gravitons with, uh, uh, with spin minus two because the plus two, uh, plus two uh, uh, spectral function is identically zero. So how do we understand this chirality? So this actually goes back to the topology. So for the laughing state, as I, uh, uh, well, I don't need to explain this, the minimum relative angular momentum of a pair of electrons is actually three. 
plus three for this uh, particular orientation, a graviton excitation is actually like this pair. So that actually is a pair of electrons with angular momentum plus one. And that is why the change of angular momentum is minus two, okay? Well, similarly for the Morid state, if you look at a three electron cluster, the minimum total angular momentum is, uh, is five, while the graviton excitation uh, would, have ex uh, would have a three electron cluster of, uh, of course, uh, uh, three, which would be the minimum angular momentum allowed by Pauli principle. And of course, uh, if you perform a particle transformation to go to the whole state, let's say for n equals to um, two thirds, then these dancers are no longer electrons but holes, and they would be actually uh, dancing with opposite priority, and therefore the graviton would have plus two instead of minus two. Now we're interested in the more read state because of five half. But what's unusual about five half is that it actually allows for other dancing patterns, not just the more read, uh, including the anti parfian and the particle hole parfian, which we heard quite a bit about over the, uh, over the last week. And they wouldn't have uh, the same a, a, a dancing pattern and therefore the graviton priority will not be the same. So if you actually use the simplest possible model uh, of just a cooling interaction projected to uh, the second lambda level, uh, well, we have particle symmetry, so we shouldn't have any net priority. And indeed we find that uh, the spectral function is exactly the same for plus and minus. So the graviton excitations are there, but you wouldn't be able to actually have uh, find a definitive priority. On the other hand, uh, real systems are not particle symmetric uh, for uh, uh, various reasons, in particular lambda level mixing. And if you add a small positive three body interaction, 101 in uh, Coulomb units, you immediately suppress I plus as compared to I minus, uh, the spectral weight is something like 20%. So you are back to the Morid or Fabian case and the dominant graviton response or Raman response should be in the minus two channel. Well, in reality, it's expected that the lambda level mixing effects would favor anti Fabian, and uh, this uh, amount of uh, uh, three body interaction is actually uh, roughly what you should get for realistic samples. And we find uh, the exact opposite, which is the graviton response is dominated by plus two and the minus two response is about 10% uh, of plus two. So the point is therefore uh, the graviton chirality uh, can help uh, uh, distinguish these competing uh, topological orders uh, at five halves. So I'm not sure how many minutes I still have. Two uh, more minutes. Two more minutes, that's actually perfect. So let me actually end by quoting Modi Halbron, who said quite forcefully yesterday that Bach says it all, although I'm using this quote in a slightly different uh, context. So the point is that we have been mostly using edge to probe the Bach topological order, but edges are complicated, as uh, discussed uh, 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 by Modi and others. Um, well, some of you may be aware that I actually uh, uh, spend a lot of time working on edge states, uh, in particular edge reconstruction. Um, but my real obsession is actually in the bulk. So uh, this actually goes back to my paper with Bert uh, uh, 11 years ago now, where we proposed using bulk thermoelectric and thermodynamic measurements to probe non-abelian uh, 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 statistics by measuring the uh, non-abelian entropy. Um, uh, 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 Cooper and Stern uh, had very similar ideas at the time. I had some follow-up work. Jim Eisen fan made some, to me, very encouraging initial attempts. Unfortunately, it's not followed up. Uh, even if this idea uh, works out completely, it only measures the quantum dimension of the non-abelians, in this case, basically my Rana fermions. Uh, so the quantum dimension is square root of two, but that's the same for Parfian, anti parfian and the pH parfian. So, so this wouldn't, uh, 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 pin down the specific topological order at five half, but in combination with, with our new idea, uh, we can at least uh, potentially pin down the exact topological order. 
So, so as Modi said very well yesterday, Hawk says it all. So, so let me just uh, uh, maybe, well, there's some propaganda, so maybe I actually shouldn't say them in words, but instead just uh, put them on the, on the, on, on the screen and, uh, and stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kun. It was a very nice talk. And uh, now the floor is open for questions. 